watching The Late Show. Now, let me just say to you right away, this is not a live programme, so you won't be able to take part in it. But you will be able to see uh, and join us in a future time when my guest, who I'm going to introduce to in a minute, will be able to join us uh, via Skype. It's just not possible today to do this live as it's a pre-recorded programme. But the topic is very important. Let me first of all introduce uh, today's special guest, Mark Anderson. Mark, welcome to the programme. Thank you, Howard. Now, you say you're a Bible teacher. I know very little about you. I've got your book, which I, I'm a third of the way through, and it, it's thanks to being in the hospital waiting room this afternoon that I was able to get the opportunity to read this, and I'm a third of the way through it. And the title of the book, To Cease or Not to Cease, The Spiritual Gifts of Today. Uh, looking at it from a biblical point of view, because this is quite you know, sort of controversial topic, isn't it? Especially it is. amongst uh, Pentecostals, Charismatics, uh, and even the traditional church. You know, where should we be looking at? What should we be saying? What should we be believing? Are the gifts uh, that something, the gifts of the spirit, that is, something that was done away with at the time of the, uh, say, the last apostle, uh, that would have been John? Uh, or is it something that uh, has a greater application even in the modern day church of today? Well, I'll be totally upfront, hard, right at the outset and say that I believe emphatically that the gifts of the Holy Spirit, as outlined in 1 Corinthians 12 and 14, are very much a part of church life today. Uh, I can't find any evidence in the scriptures to suggest otherwise. Um, but respectfully, there are a number of denominations uh, who believe otherwise that the supernatural gifts of the Holy Spirit were withdrawn whenever the canon of Scripture was complete, uh, when the last apostle died. But uh, as I say, I can't find any evidence to support that view. And I can confidently say I'm not alone. There are many yes. millions around the world that... Uh, would uh, subscribe to the view that the gifts of the Spirit are most definitely for today's church. Yeah. Let's remind our viewers what, the, what Corinthians is talking about. Do you want to just uh, paraphrase what is spoken there by the Apostle Paul? Well, if you look at 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, uh, those chapters uh, specifically address the gifts of the Holy Spirit, where the Holy Spirit manifests himself in various ways in the assembled community of believers. Um, I think it's important to stress that those chapters really are set in the context of worship, where the church assembles for worship and the Holy Spirit is present. Jesus presences himself whenever believers meet together through his Spirit. And essentially the gifts, or as Paul describes them, the manifestations of the Holy Spirit is when the Holy Spirit expresses himself when the believers come together. And he expresses himself for the sole purpose of edifying the believers, of strengthening and edifying the church. Mm. Now, I suppose it's a good place to start. And I, w one of the things that I do like about uh, the way that you've approached this in your book is that you're saying really, there's a lot to learn. There's a lot of things, uh, we know where you're coming from right away, but there's a lot of things that, that people could look at in the Pentecostal church particularly, that perhaps they've gone over the top on some things, and that might put people off from accepting anything to do with Pentecostalism, which includes uh, recognizing the gifts of the Spirit. Yes, I fully agree with that and appreciate that. In fact, um, and I, I really do believe that a lot of people are reluctant to approach this subject and indeed seek to experience what God the Holy Spirit has for them. Uh, some are reluctant, obviously, because they've been brought up in a denomination that has taught them otherwise. But I have to be honest to, to admit that others are reluctant to do so simply because overzealous Pentecostals, Charismatics have misrepresented these gifts. And that has put a lot of people off, if I say, for life. Uh, they've just had a bad experience. Um, but I think it's fair to say, though, in many other denominations, there are extremes also. It's not just the Pentecostal charismatic uh, movement. But I would be totally honest and agree with you that there have been excesses. But there were excesses in the Corinthian church. I think we have to realize that the Corinthian church were experiencing an abundance 
of miracles, of the Holy Spirit manifesting himself in various gifts, so much so that many churches today would just long for that to happen. But clearly in Corinth there were abuses. But what I find interesting is Paul's approach. He doesn't come along and say, okay, folks, you need to tone it down. Rather, he brings correction. The correction to abuse is not non-use, but it's merely just correction. Mm. We're talking in particular about uh, speaking in tongues, wasn't it? Well, speaking in tongues uh, in Corinth was a gift that Paul himself prized very highly, but clearly it was a gift that became almost an obsession by the Corinthian church. They saw it almost as the pinnacle of spirituality, of having arrived because they spoke in tongues. And while it has its place, while it's an invaluable gift, uh, the Corinthians went overboard. And so Paul actually, when he opens up this theme of the gifts of the Spirit, he goes at great lengths to emphasize that the Holy Spirit is diverse. The body of Christ is made up of various people from various cultures, colors, creed. We're a diverse body of believers. And equally, the Holy Spirit manifests himself in many ways. But the Corinthians made the mistake of just seeing only one manifestation in particular, i.e. tongues, and they really just went overboard in that. And so Paul had to address that by, first of all, laying the foundation, letting the Holy Spirit manifest himself, but emphasizing that he is a diverse spirit. He manifests himself in various ways. There are many members of the body. Each has something to bring uh, for the benefit of the church to contribute through the Holy Spirit and just let him manifest himself in the diverse ways he chooses to. Now we're going to come back to the Holy Spirit because you deal with it in the book um, uh, very well indeed. And I think it is Thank an you. important point as to who or what is the Holy Spirit. So we'll come back to that in a minute. But first, Mark, give us a little bit of your background so that people know where you're where you're coming from and on sort of which denomination or, you know, what is it that's enlightened you through what teachings, uh, you know, denomination, etc. Okay. Well, I, I come from a place called Armagh, first of all, in Northern Ireland. Uh, I'm married to Rosna, my Malaysian wife, and uh, together we have three children, Joanna, Zoe, and Zachary. Uh, I've been involved in ministry since 1990. Uh, I came to faith in Christ uh, around five years old, so I've been a believer over 30 years. Um, my own background is Pentecostal, so some might say I'm biased. Well, I don't make any apologies for that. Um, but like I said just a few moments ago, there have been excesses, there have been extremes, and my own burden Whilst I'm, a, a, I'm emphatic about the gifts of the Spirit uh, being for today and people should seek them, equally, I think it's very important to balance that with good systematic Bible teaching. I'm just as an enthusiast for good expository uh, Bible preaching, systematic theology, as I am to seeing the Holy Spirit move, but there needs to be that balance. And as I said in my book, whatever manifestation of the Holy Spirit, uh, it has to be tested against the Word of God. And Scripture has the final say. The gifts of the Spirit are subject to Scripture. Uh, I don't agree with people going off uh, on some subjective experience, be it a vision and a dream, and disregarding Scripture. It has to conform with Scripture. That, for me, is the number one test. So I, it's important that we place the Word of God in its rightful place, and that has the final say. Mm. I like the way you started with the book as well, a question of identity, really coming back to who is or what is the Holy Spirit, because we have many viewers I know, because I receive questions. Some say it's a force, it's an it, mm. and others will say, of course not, it, the Holy Spirit is part of the triune Godhead. Yes. So uh, what scriptures do you have uh, that would counter th those that would say that it's an it or a force? Well, I think you need to look uh, at the Gospel of John in particular. Um, the Holy Spirit is described with the pronoun he. He is a person. 
He can be grieved, the Bible makes that clear. Um, he can be uh, wounded. Um, offended. Offended. Which is the same as grieved. I grieved, suppose, yes, yeah. he can be quenched. Um, whenever Jesus described him, again, he used the pronoun he. He said of the Spirit that uh, he would show you things to come. He would bring all things to remembrance. He would reprove or convict the world of sin. Uh, he is a person, but more specifically, he is God. Mm. And uh, the Bible makes that very clear. I, th I think of the incident with Ananias and Sapphira. Oh, yes. That's who a both really lied mm -hmm. um, about their, their giving. And um, when Peter brought the rebuke, he said, look, you haven't lied to men. You, how is it that you both agreed together to test or tempt the, the Holy Spirit? You haven't lied to men, you've lied to God. Yes. So the Holy Spirit is God. Yeah. Identifying to... the two as one, really, in that scripture. It's a very good scripture, actually. Mm -hmm. when, I read, when I read your book, again, you, you make things very clear. Obviously, there's, uh, other people have other thoughts, but this yeah. is an opportunity uh, at least to get what you're saying about it from the book, which I think is, is, is very clear so mm -hmm. far from what I've read. And uh, we will uh, give you an opportunity at a later date, at a later program, to be able to come uh, via Skype Mark, and yes. join us on a live show so that give an opportunity to our viewers to interact because this is a pre-record. Now, I like the scripture here that you bring into your book, which is 1 Corinthians 2.11, where it says, for who knows a person's thought except the spirit of that person uh, which is in him? Uh, so also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. So talking about the spirit cannot be in it or a, mm -hmm. or a, or a force. Yes, yeah. No, the, the Holy Spirit is God. And um, Jesus, I think it's important to remember that before Jesus ascended, uh, he told the disciples to wait, that they would be endued with power from on high. But that power wasn't just to give them a spiritual experience. It, it wasn't was for, a force, no. as some would say. Yes, no, the, it, he was speaking of the person of the Spirit who would come and uh, they would receive power, the disciples, after the Holy Spirit had come upon them. Mm. Uh, the Holy Spirit is God, he's a person, and it's important uh, in the life of the believer that we allow and welcome the Holy Spirit and acknowledge him. Because if we are to fulfill the Great Commission, if we're to be effective in whatever sphere of ministry the Lord has called us to, we need the power of the Holy Spirit especially in the days we live in, because it's interesting, whenever Jesus said the, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and give you power, he said you would, be power, you would be given power to be my witnesses. And the word witness there actually is the word martyr. Now, in the United Kingdom, we're not at the stage where people are having to give their life uh, for the Lord. A but, living sacrifice. A, yes. <laughs> But nevertheless, I mean, pressures against the believers already are, are heightening, and we need the power of God to stand firm. Hmm. Now, another significant uh, mention in the scripture here is about the Holy Spirit giving gifts to men or in men, yes. uh, different <clears throat> uh, gifts, as you mentioned earlier. Yes. Uh, if that was a force or a knit, uh, it wouldn't have the comprehension to do that, to choose. That's correct. Okay, so. You're quite right. I mean, the Holy Spirit has intellect. Yes. In the reference that you made, the Holy Spirit, to put it in plain, simple English, decides who gets what gift and when they get it. Now, which scripture is that? Just to... It'd be in 1 Corinthians 12, where Paul cites, to one is given, uh, the gift and, and so this. on. Yeah. So here we see the Holy Spirit is distributing gifts. There's mm -hmm. intellect there. He's a person. A force obviously doesn't have intellect. A force cannot be grieved or quenched. A force cannot love. Yeah. And yet the Bible speaks of the love of the Holy Spirit, the love of the yes. Spirit. So, And also uh, re being refreshed in, in these scriptures uh, just by reading your book tonight was the um, mention here that uh, the, the Holy Spirit intercedes on our behalf. You That's can't do correct. that if it's an it or a force. Yes. Or a power. Yeah. It has intellect. Absolutely. It's a being. Yes. Yeah. Now, the other things, let me just try and look, because I didn't have a pen with me in the hospital either. Uh, you're not allowed anything. I, I was 
amazed that I got my book in, that or your your book in. Um, but some of the things that you mentioned here um, that I'd like to uh, bring out is the cessation of the, of these gifts. If we accept that the gifts were there in the first place mm -hmm. and it is the Holy Spirit, why would, uh, or what arguments do the secessionists uh, bring in to say that the gifts have stopped? That you would say they, there's probably two or three that they would point to as scriptures. Can you recite those? Yes, I would say, first of all, Howard, yes, they appeal to scripture. Um, cessationists would accuse Pentecostals of appealing quite a lot to experience. And to a certain extent, that's true. But I would equally suggest that cessationists also appeal to experience uh, to bolster their claim that the gifts have ceased. In what, uh, way, in what way? Because it seems a contradiction in terms. Well, the Pentecostals, I suppose, are accused of um, appealing to experience. Yes. And, and, and being weak on the scriptures. And almost wishing it and wanting yes. it every time that possible. That's correct. The cessationists, yes, they appeal to scriptures, but I would also say their experience also they appeal to for the simple reason, and, and I'm saying this respectfully, perhaps they're not seeing people healed. Perhaps... Um, but they got, were disappointed because the healing didn't take place? Yes. Either for themselves uh, or others? And, and perhaps because they have never um, witnessed a healing or a miracle or, or heard of one medically confirmed, they're appealing to experience as well as scripture. And that experience undergirds their belief in their interpretation of scripture, which suggests that the gifts have ceased. Um, before we look maybe at the scriptures, um, one appeal that I make right at the outset in my book is that people would approach uh, with an open mind. If we're honest, and all believers do this, we tend to come to the Word of God with presuppositions, with our own bias, maybe our it's own human prejudice. Nature, isn't it? it's, just, it's human nature. Yeah. The only presupposition we should come to the Bible is believing that it's inspired. It's the By word the of God, Spirit. absolutely. And, and be open and really just lay aside our presuppositions and with an open mind, examine the scriptures in their context to see what they're saying. I, I suppose the main scripture uh, that cessationists would appeal to is 1 Corinthians 13, where it references tongues. There will come a time when they will cease. Knowledge will, will vanish away. And the cessationist interprets that passage of scripture uh, as referring to the, the canon of scripture. When the last apostle died and we have the last record of scripture and the canon's complete, uh, there's no need for any gifts. Gifts were given to the apostles because they wrote scripture and to kickstart the early church. But now we have the completed canon. We have the whole Bible. We don't need the gifts anymore. And that's essentially... Uh, the argument that the cessationists would say use. The danger with that is if something does manifest that is supernatural, they would say that was demonic rather than of God. Well, I think they would be forced to admit that because of their belief in Scripture, that if they don't believe God's doing this today, uh, and I have to qualify, there are some cessationists that will admit that God does heal today. They maybe don't expect it, uh, they maybe don't pray for it, but I suppose uh, in their interaction with other believers, they will admit that, that he does. It's interesting that they wouldn't have a problem praying, God, uh, guide the surgeon as he performs the operation, or God, heal little Johnny's headache. But when it comes to something major, Lord, open those blind eyes. While they believe God can do it, generally they won't actually pray such a prayer because of their belief. But you're quite right. Um, whenever something does happen, usually uh, because of their belief, they'll be very cautious. They'll say, well, you know, you have to test the spirits. And we do. But rather than admit that God has intervened, generally they'll be very suspicious. And again, it's coming from their belief, which has been ingrained in many cases from their church background from a very young age. Mm -hmm. 
I, I think I would say that I was very much uh, brought up that the gifts were not for today uh, in the sense that uh, belonged to a, a group of uh, well, Jehovah's Witnesses, for example. I was with them for many years as a, in my early 20s. And they certainly didn't accept that God would work in the miraculous in that sense. So when I came out of the witnesses and was looking to see what God was doing, I was very suspicious of these gifts as I saw them, as I visited different churches, trying to find somewhere I could fit in. Um, and so I experienced uh, firsthand, particularly when I was on board uh, the Anastasis, the Mercy Ships. I've shared this before, but I want to put this mm. in context of what mm. you're saying tonight, is that it's to have an open mind because it was a particular day. I, I did actually say, you know, I've seen enough of this Pentecostalism where it would seem they were almost invoking uh, for something to happen and going overboard with it. Mm. Uh, and when people were being prayed uh, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and I was, it just didn't sit right with me. But this one day I did say, okay, Lord, if you have got something like that, and it is of you, mm. I don't want to miss it. I want it. And that day was a significant day in my life in 1989. I think it was June the 2nd or something like that. Mm. And the Spirit of God came in me and filled me in a, in a quite a supernatural way. And, but it was something, because I experienced it myself, and it wasn't something I was, uh, if you like, wishing to happen and, and trying with great expectancy, mm -hmm. I was quite reluctant. And when it did start to happen, I even said, look, I'm, I'm, I'm English, you know, I can't really deal with this. But the power of God was even greater than that. And he was such a gentleman in the way in which he did it. He didn't do it in the way that I saw other people do it. Yes. And even when I questioned the man who prayed for me, and thank God he didn't touch me because I didn't want any of this laying, poof, push me back and all of that. Mm. I wanted it to be God. And it was just incredible. So that started me looking at other things that if God was on the move in the supernatural, that was great. Mm. I mean, we visited from that time a few weeks later we were in the Dominican Republic on the borders of Haiti which were very very poor the poverty was incredible people were sick and dying and they needed the power of God because they didn't have hospitals that they could go to we did we were a hospital ship mm -hmm. but the, we were doing both things but they, the surgeons were praying and there were occasions where miracles happened that they didn't need to do anything in fact sometimes they couldn't do anything and they still prayed and there was but it didn't happen every time yeah but that experience led me to understand that if God, God is God, if he wants to do something according to his will, let it be done. Absolutely. Uh, and so therefore I say to people who are watching, who might, like myself, have been very skeptical about the gifts of the Spirit, um, but don't let that put you off. Yes, you'll see some funny things and people are a bit overzealous, as you said, mm. Mark. I just wanted to add that because I've experienced that and it would have been to my detriment and to, I uh, would have been still uh, without that revelation of what God's power and Holy Spirit could do if I'd have uh, been uh, very typically British and, and consistent, uh, consistently went on in my way of not believing really. Mm -hmm. So I say it just to encourage others. Yes. Coming on to some of the other things you, you mention in the book, um, I like what you said about the little bit of the history with the Roman Catholic Church and the Protestant, uh, there was a well, the Reformation. Can you remember? Well, of course you would. You <laughs> I can't quite remember what it was, but it was something that tickled me a little bit a few hours ago when I read this. Yes, well, obviously uh, most of the viewers will be familiar with uh, the, the Reformation where Martin Luther uh, got a revelation of justification by faith and nailed his thesis to the door of Wittenberg Cathedral. Um, as a result of the Reformation, the Roman Catholic Church obviously was suffering. They were losing numbers. And so uh, a Cardinal uh, Bellarmine was dispatched to try and, uh, you know, win some of these converts back to the Catholic Church. And basically he threw down the gauntlet and said, the Catholic Church is experiencing, and I, I use this loosely in inverted commas, quote unquote, miracles where are your miracles? So he laid down the mm. gauntlet really to the Protestant church. Mm. And obviously, uh, you know, the reformers had to respond 
and I think it was uh, John Calvin, I'm not quite sure of the quote, I might have it in the book, where he does make a quote about the gift of healing is in essence not for today or no longer uh, Would you say manifest. that was the beginning of the cessationists then? Um, well, it must have existed before, but I mean, I, I would, yeah. I mean, I mean, there's always been throughout history. There's, there's, it's been documented of the miraculous. God, you know, there's always evidence for God continuing to heal and 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 do miracles and so on. So yeah, I suppose perhaps the roots were there, maybe even back further. I'm I'm sure uh, it coexisted with those who believed in the supernatural power of God. There were always some that maybe were skeptical. And maybe and didn't believe. Now, of course, the, there are other scriptures which are used by secessionists. Uh, is there something there you want to bring up right now on, with regards to that? And then we move on to looking at the um, the scriptures as far as having been consistently uh, revealed in scripture that the the gifts are numerous and they're not just about healing. Mm -hmm. And we can talk about those as well. Well, I think the other most cited scripture probably would be Ephesians 2.20, where it speaks about the church, the foundation of the church being upon the apostles and the prophets. Um, and again, it's linked. Uh, cessationists say apostles were given supernatural gifts to authent authenticate their credibility uh, as messengers from God to write scripture. And so God gave them supernatural gifts, but since the apostles are no longer here, uh, we no longer lead the gifts. And Ephesians 2.20 essentially says that the church was built on the foundation uh, of the apostles and the prophets. So they were the foundation. Uh, the gifts were given at a time for the apostles. Apostles aren't no longer with us, so the gifts aren't required anymore. Mm. Well, when you think of uh, biblical history, the gifts of the Spirit were in Genesis, uh, in the, the prophets, mm -hmm. particularly you mentioned in your book, uh, Elijah. I mean, it is amazing what he did in his uh, profound faith that God was going to be the God yes. who answers by fire. Oh, absolutely. He exhibited an incredible faith, not only digging a trench around Mount Carmel, but pouring gallons of water Three times. And uh, water was a scarcity in those days as well That's because it, of drought. But, so it was a real uh, step of faith mm. and God honored it. Yeah. Now, if God used his, uh, the Holy Spirit to do the establishing in, in, in um, pre-Christian era and then in the, the establishment of the early church, why should he not, and if not more so, do it today? That's, that's a very valid point, yes. Because I, we're in much need of seeing the power of God because we're, we're living in a very secular world, atheistic, agnostic, and if they didn't see the power of God, it's almost like this studio, you wouldn't see anything but darkness, spiritual darkness uh, akin to, if the electricity was pulled off. So therefore, I, I know from my own experience, I found that the power of God that entered me was like a, uh, an incredible power that went through me that when I went into ministry uh, following in, in Haiti and the borders thereof, um, that w I saw and experienced firsthand praying for people and the power that came out of my body, my torso, into the people that I prayed for. I mean, it was just something I, I didn't understand. I had no foreknowledge of, so I couldn't have thought about mm. this, I couldn't have, uh, you know, made it, I couldn't make it happen. It was just an experience that I found so profound. But uh, again, if we are uh, vessels that God are going to use in the 20 20th century, as it was there in the 21st century, we've got to have that dominus power of God yeah. to, in order to make our evangelistic outreach, um, you know, s sustainable, if you like, or powerful enough to bring in those who are so probably more skeptical today because of the, the people that you see time and time again on television being so anti-God and uh, putting us down because we have faith. Uh, and it's almost like we're, uh, we've got more of a spiritual battle for souls today than there ever was. Yeah. So we need these gifts. And you go into them and mark them, because let's just uh, go away from the healing 
part of it. So let's move on to say the gifts of knowledge, the gift of wisdom, uh, discernment. You know, you talk about that in your book. Uh, give us a bit of an overview on that. Well, actually, um, the approach that I take to wisdom and knowledge would not be the classical Pentecostal line. Now, I, I'm in no way, and I do say that in my book, being dogmatic. There is a method in why I, I present them in the way that I do. Now, if you take wisdom, for example, uh, it's rendered in the Greek as the message of wisdom. And it's significant that you have the definite article there because the emphasis is on the message. Teaching. Um, well, actually, where wisdom is concerned, I would see it more akin to the preaching of the cross. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, Paul uh, expands on this theme. He speaks of the, the foolishness of God and the wisdom of God. Now, let me just qualify also, Howard. I believe God gives supernatural wisdom. James says, if anyone lack wisdom, let him ask God. I believe God gives wisdom. He gives us insight into problems that we know what to do. And it's by the Holy Spirit. Totally agree, believe that. Not through man's I've, intellect. I've experienced it myself. Yeah. But the wisdom that Paul is referring to, I don't believe is that wisdom. If you think of 1 Corinthians, there are 15 chapters, um, or 16 chapters, sorry. It's a whole letter. And Paul deals with wisdom in the early chapters. It was something actually that the Greeks were obsessed with. The Corinthians, being influenced by Greek culture, were very much obsessed with wisdom. But I see wisdom, the message of wisdom, as the preaching of the cross. When, when I examine it in, in the context of 1 Corinthians 2, um, that's what I see it. Um, so what, what do you see is being uh, not fully understood in the modern day Pentecostalism when you're talking about, say, a word of knowledge? Well, Pentecostals would describe the word of knowledge as follows. Uh, a preacher maybe um, will stand up and say, there's someone here uh, and you've had uh, this complaint in your body, you've had migraine headaches maybe for the last 20 years, you had one just last month and, and you've been to this doctor and that doctor and so on. Getting insight into a situation, I believe in that. But I don't believe in the way that modern Pentecostals express it and describe it. What Pentecostals call a word of knowledge, as I've just described, I see that more under the umbrella of prophetic ministry. So when someone says, uh, particularly when they address an individual and not just a broad message, there's somebody out there, and there's, if you, especially if you're a television evangelist or got a program on Christian television, you're all over the world, there's gonna be somebody out there who's suffering with something in their arm or neck or, you know, that's me and they, they pull down as it were, I'll have that mm -hmm. uh, miracle, thank you very much. And, Often it works, yeah. so you can't, you know, deny that. Yeah. But that's not a word of knowledge, as you say. It's more um, a prophecy. I call it because yes. you're, you're getting a prophetic word from the Lord. Yes, I define prophecy hard, as in the gift of prophecy, as very simple. God revealing something to you, and you simply communicating. Now that may be a thought, it may be a scripture verse that comes to mind and you speak it out and it ministers into someone's situation. I don't believe prophecy has to be someone standing up and saying, thus says the Lord, so on. It can be just simply God impressing something in your heart, be it a scripture, a picture, a thought, and you releasing that, speaking it out, and it just blessing someone. Now, with regards word of knowledge and the way Pentecostals would express it, as I say, I put that under the umbrella of prophecy. Paul tells us, Speaking about exercising the gift of prophecy in 1 Corinthians 14, he says, whenever someone is prophesying, the secrets of one's heart are revealed, are revealed made bare. Now, what Pentecostals describe as a word of knowledge, my question is, why can't that equally be described as prophetic? When the secrets of someone's heart are being revealed. Somebody here with a kidney problem, 
That's the secret of their heart being revealed. Mm. People call it a word of knowledge. Yeah. I call it prophecy. Okay. Let me give you an example. I was uh, in a church uh, that I was visiting, and because I'd experienced a few things, this was in the late 80s, after my visit on mercy ships, when all sorts of things were beginning to happen, and uh, visiting the church, and I waited till the church service had finished because I was running late, and uh, meeting some friends there. And I walked in and this man looked at me and he said, do you mind if I pray with you? And I said, okay. And uh, he said, you just turned down going to, uh, for a ministry to go to Europe, uh, to Eastern Europe. Uh, you turned it down today. Now, where did he get that information from? Mm -hmm. um, and I said, yes, that's right. Um, Harvest International Ministries was the name of the ministry. Well enough, I remember that after all these years. And I had said I, I wouldn't go, but he said to me, the Lord wants you to go. And I said, I'll go, I'll be obedient. Mm -hmm. Now my friends who were in that church, whose church it was and were used to this sort of thing, said to me, you're not going, are you? I said, you bet I am. I'm not gonna miss out on that being God. Mm -hmm. I'd rather take the risk mm -hmm. and go. It's not far, is it? Mm -hmm. yeah. It's not only like 7,000 miles or 6,000 miles or something. Anyway, mm -hmm. the thing is, what was that then if it wasn't a word of knowledge? Well, I, I call it, as Paul describes prophecy in 1 Corinthians 14, the secrets of one's heart being revealed. Obviously, you wouldn't have disclosed that to many people. And yet... No, I, I hadn't even spoken to my wife. She was in England. I was in America. So it was something in your heart that was that nobody else knew. Yeah. So I, I would class that... All I wanted that, to do was... All I wanted to do was serve God. It doesn't matter where he would send me, but I didn't want it to be me in the natural that was doing it. Mm -hmm. That's the thing. Whereas it would have been if I ex had accepted the assignment that afternoon, but in the evening, it's a different story. God wanted me to do it. I mean, another example in that same vein, if you think of Jesus with the woman at the well. Yes. You, you, you've had five husbands and the one you're with now, he's not your husband. And what did she say? She said, sir, I perceive you, you are a prophet. The secrets of our heart. Yeah. You know, a lot of it, I think, hard comes down to semantics. But I purposely go down that line because I believe it from Paul's definition of prophecy, the secrets of one's heart being revealed. But also, in the book, I describe the word of knowledge. And again, I, I do make it clear I'm not being dogmatic. Um, I'm in good company. Donald G goes along this with the same agreement, but um, I see it more akin to a teaching ministry where the Holy Spirit will illuminate truth from the Word of God and give fresh insight. Think about it like this. You've heard Bible teachers, I'm sure, speaking about the fivefold ministry apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. And I've heard it say, well, the evangelist, what gifts does he have? Well, he's on the mission field. He's preaching. He has to make Jesus real. Well, he gets the gifts of healings. He gets the gift of miracles and gift of faith. What about the prophet? Oh, well, I've heard them say, well, he gets discerning of spirits. He gets the word of knowledge. He gets the word of wisdom. What about the apostle? Well, he gets all, he gets the whole lot. <laughs> what about the teacher? Oh, I'm not sure about him. So I think the word of knowledge, and Paul actually, there is one scripture where he has revelation and prophecy and teaching and knowledge in almost parallel. And I suspect that the, the word of knowledge is closely tied to a teaching gift. Now, it's not just acquiring knowledge. It's not acquiring facts and information from Scripture. It's not that. It's where the Holy Spirit is giving fresh insight. It's an illumination. An illumination. Revelation. I mean, we're not talking about changing the meaning of Scripture, mm. yeah. but a fresh insight application to a particular situation. That's what I see, the word of knowledge. And the reason why I define the word or the message of wisdom the way I did as the preaching of the cross and the reason why I defined the message of knowledge the way I did is because there would be many cessationists today who would have to admit they have experienced those two experiences. Oh. 
There's, there are Bible teachers, there are preachers who would be cessationists, but they would have to admit that God gave them insight or a quickening of revelation into the Word that they hadn't seen before. Well, if they hadn't, and they, and they were never to expect that, the Word of God would be like not a living water. Yes. It would not be bringing anything to them because uh, it would just be knowledge, and knowledge puffs up. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can cite this scripture, that scripture, but if it, if it doesn't reveal something to you through the Holy Spirit, and, and um, again, I guess give a personal um, insight as to what happened to me was I was reading scripture all on my own. I hadn't even heard th this teaching ever at that time in my life. I think it was about 1978, 79. And I was reading Romans chapter 11. Now I'd read the Bible from beginning to end, probably more than once at that stage. So I'd been reading it probably for about eight or nine years. So by that time, probably at least a couple of times I'd read th this passage mm -hmm. without, as with other passages, just gone right over my head. And suddenly jumped off the pages. In fact, I stopped when it said, this is a sacred secret. And I just stopped that rendition of, of the Bible that I was reading then, rendered it, the word that way. And I stopped and said, what is this? What is this revelation? What is it? I want to know. Mm. And uh, it's all about Israel mm -hmm. and God not rejecting his people. Um, and the way that God has a will and purpose for Israel or for the Jews as well, particularly. Now, that was incredible. And, and, and scriptures like that keep coming. You know, you'll read, I know we all experience it, so even the cessationists have got to. Yes. You read a passage and you go, I never saw that before. Mm -hmm. And it's a quickening, isn't it, as you say? Yeah. My goodness. Yeah. So the thing is, Howard, my question is, if cessationists have experienced that, then the word of knowledge, the word of wisdom are for today. So then there's no grounds to exclude the others. Yes. You're, you're, you're talking nine gifts, is that right? There's you know? nine listed. I, 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 I personally don't think Paul's it stops actually... There. Yeah, I yeah. don't think it stops there. Yeah. yeah. But out of the nine, how many are the ones... It's mainly the healing ones, isn't it, that are a problem? With uh, the tongues and prophecy yeah. as well. I mean, many... Oh, really? So it's three? Well, people would see prophecy as adding to Scripture. I mean, that's not... True. Okay. I mean, the Bible doesn't say that, but that's the mindset. That's the belief that many have. Mm. I mean, even to the, the extent of me sitting here today on television set on a, uh, on a channel that I, the last thing I wanted to do, trust me, I was in the music industry. I loved the music industry. Well, why would I give up music, which is the love of my life? Uh, it was because prophets had spoken or people, men of God or women of God even, uh, spoken to my life, said, you're God saying you're going to do this, this and this. And I'm going, oh, no, not really. Mm. No, no, no. My little heart was in trepidation. But because God was in it, it happened. I would never have been able to manipulate, maneuver uh, events to, to, to this extent. It's yeah. not humanly possible. I haven't got the intellect. I haven't got the wherewithal. I just, I would, <laughs> I really just had to be God. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, the fact that I'm, involved in a, in a preaching and teaching ministry was the result of getting a prophecy myself when I was only 18. Mm. And like you, when it came, I was fearful, excited, yeah. but fearful. <laughs> but the Lord works it out in his own way. Yeah. Yeah. And thank God for them, because I, I would say it would never have happened if, if it hadn't, if those gifts weren't in existence today. Mm. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, and certainly coming from a very much uh, a, a non-believer, in, even in Scripture at the beginning, to have to get to where I'm at is, uh, is only through the gifts of the Spirit operating through uh, the church, the people of the church, the congregation, yes. and thank God for it. Now, in the, in the last uh, 10 minutes of this particular program, um, you know, we're talking, again, just to remind our viewers, to cease or not to cease, spiritual gifts today. This is the book uh, by Mark Anderson. It's his second book as an author. And it says a very clear scriptural foundation in presenting the gifts of the Holy Spirit and their validity today. You know, we will have 
mark on a uh, future time because this is not possible to interact with you because this has been pre-recorded. I want you to know that, but we will have Mark uh, with us again sometime uh, in the near future uh, on via Skype so that he can answer your questions. I'm sure you'll have questions as well that you want to put, but not today because it's not possible because uh, this is pre-recorded. Now, Mark, um, other things. I only got a third way through the book before I had to have my little operation. Uh, so having s sat in the hospital waiting room waiting for this, I got, I'm excited by what I've, I've read. And, you know, and I agree with what, uh, you know, to a certain extent. I mean, I'm, some parts you say, you know, uh, I'm not quite sure about with regards to, you know, whether it's uh, prophecy or whether it's word of knowledge or whatever. But that's semantics. Mm. It doesn't really matter. The fact is God is working yeah. uh, through his spirit uh, through us to empower us to reach a lost and dying world. A little bit of a cliche there. Mm -hmm. But then I don't think in this day and age when you've got movies and sound or films, I was going to say sound tracks, but films uh, and all of that which use amazing special effects that uh, today God is an even greater special effects mm -hmm. uh, uh, creator. Yes. And uh, we, we want to see him work in order to do, uh, to draw people into the kingdom uh, whilst there's time, because I, I don't know about you, but I believe that the window of opportunity is, is only open for a, a, a certain time. Yes. And then when the fullness of the Gentiles is finished, uh, God will conclude this particular world system. Yeah, well, Paul tells us to redeem the time, seize the opportunity, make the most. And, um, you know, it's interesting, but when it comes to bringing the gospel to Africa, to Asia, the, the, such is the culture there. People have no problem believing in the supernatural, albeit from the wrong source. And people will go to shamans, go to witch doctors to get cures for their ailments. When someone stands up to preach the message, they need God to come and demonstrate it. And you know, that's, I believe, where the gifts of the Spirit are required where God, and God will honor his word, he will come mm -hmm. and, and demonstrate it. Well, Jesus was a prime example of how, uh, and if he, if you let me put it like this, if he, he had to use it, uh, those gifts, in order to pull in the people, which he did, in, in absolute hordes of people were following him day and night because of the miracles he was performing. Yeah. And, you know, I'm sure some of those uh, would not have been in it for the long journey of following him as a disciple. Uh, but many became believers because of those very miracles. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and um, the message hasn't changed. Jesus said, go make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. I mean, that's a perpetual message. There's no evidence that that had to be changed, you know. And, uh, you know, those of us that believe in the gifts of the Spirit, we're just seeking to carry out the Great Commission and believe in God to confirm his word. Now, I, as I say, I only got a third way through. Do you want to help us to go through the book uh, in summary uh, for the next uh, seven minutes or so? Well, I think it's important, Howard, just to, to 1 Corinthians 13 is the main passage. Should we look at that? Yes. Because uh, there will be new people who perhaps uh, you know, are not Christians or not believers, but switch on to Christian television. And I believe that such uh, is the time today that people would be uh, wanting to know what on earth are we talking about. And this is a very um, famous part of the scriptures written by the Apostle Paul to the Corinthian believers. Yes, people will know this chapter. They'll hear it quoted at weddings and uh, such like. But really, uh, the key verses for the cessationists really are from verse 8 onwards. Um, Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. 
So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. And really, this chapter, Paul isn't actually trying to prove that the gifts of the Spirit are for today. That's not his intention in this chapter. He's contrasting love, which is everlasting, which is eternal, with the gifts of the Spirit, which are temporal. Now, he does tell us that they will cease. Nobody disagrees in that, but the crux is when. And he tells us, he tells us they will cease when that which is perfect is come. Now, the cessationists say the perfect refers to the closed canon of Scripture. I say it refers to the coming of the Lord, the parousia, whenever the Lord Jesus returns. And I say that for a number of reasons. One very important principle in interpreting Scripture is what's known as authorial intent. In other words, what was the author's intention? What did these words mean to Paul when he wrote them? And what these words meant to Paul cannot mean anything different to us today. Now, when Paul wrote these words, yes, he was aware he was being guided by the Holy Spirit. He did say in an earlier chapter that the things that I write are the commandments of the Lord. He was aware that the Holy Spirit was guiding him. But it was completely foreign to Paul's mind that there would be such a thing as the complete canon of Scripture. That was totally foreign to Paul's mind. And because that was not part of his mindset, that was not his intention, we cannot say that the canon of Scripture is what the perfect means because it didn't mean that to Paul. It can't mean anything different to us today. Mm. I find that uh, I didn't know that. And I would say it doesn't make sense because if anything, uh, we know that the new heavens and the new earth is where there will be perfection again. When this body uh, has disappeared, you know, and we've Mm -hmm. put it on the incorruptible, we won't do that until, uh, as you say, the millennial at least, at the very least, and then after that. Uh, So, uh, the, ch- the church is, uh, is far from perfect. Yeah. Um, and we know that Christ is coming for the bride, which is unblemished, spotless, and it's not there even yet. Yes. <laughs> um, might, might even be responsible for him not coming yet uh, because of that. But uh, certainly, if anything that was coming that was perfect, it would have been Christ himself, but he'd already been mm-hmm. uh, and in gone and come back in uh, risen i should say uh, so we know that he his return would be the only time that you could say that which is perfect would absolutely have, have come. and so. paul actually goes on to say well he he, he says uh, when i was a child i spoke like a child and when i became a man he says we see in a mirror dimly but then face to face it's like looking at a photograph and looking at a person but the the phrase face to face is interesting because that phrase occurs at least five times in the Old Testament, and it's referring to seeing a person face to face. It's not referring to a body of literature, i.e. the closed canon. It's referring to a person. Uh, One of the, the incidents was when God said, I speak with my servant Moses face to face. Whenever Jacob wrestled with the Lord of Peniel, Genesis 32, 30, face to face. Mm -hmm. And here Paul is using that phrase. But to reinforce it, Howard, there's a scripture, and a lot of people I find don't quote it enough, in 1 Corinthians 1. I think it's verse 7. And this again reiterates that, where Paul basically says to the Corinthians, don't be lacking in any gift while you wait for the coming of the Lord. And that puts the gifts in their proper time frame, and the proper the, timeline. Yeah. And the very last verse in chapter 12, 1 Corinthians 12 there, but earnestly desire the greater gifts, and I show you a still more excellent way. So he's even encouraging people here to, to desire the oh, gifts. Yes. And I suppose with secessionists, they, they would be, it'd be quite the opposite. They wouldn't want you to even consider that because they'd say it's been and gone. Um, I 
like I was, there was a thought that I, I had uh, when you were talking there, and I'm just trying to remember what it was, um, with to do with the things that are of the past. But yeah, oh yeah, I know what it was. You mentioned the the um, Jacob wrestling mm -hmm. uh, with <coughs> the Lord to get a blessing, and that was the very scripture I used just before I got filled with the Spirit. I said, Lord, if you have anything, I'll even wrestle with you mm. in order to get it. I won't just be content to say here, sit here, say, I want to be filled with the Spirit, if that is of you. Yes. But I will actually wrestle with you like Jacob mm. did. In other words, I want it, yes. but I'm not good. <clears throat> it, it wasn't in an overboard way that I, was, I wanted an experience. That's the last thing I wanted. I wanted something tangible mm. that was of God. Yes. And... Uh, being filled with the Holy Spirit that day. It empowered me to do the work of God, and it still does today. Otherwise, I'd be just a, like an electrical um, piece of equipment without electricity and just be mm. totally inactive, not able to do anything. Because we, on our own, without the gifts of the Spirit, are absolutely, totally useless. And we have such a job to do absolutely. in bringing the Word of God, as you were saying, really. This is the canon, uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ that he came, he died for us, that we may have eternal life, mm -hmm. be forgiven of our sins, I mean, and see that new heaven and new earth. To me, it's the most incredible message. Yes. Uh, it, when I first heard it, well, I was 21 years of age, and here I am, nearly 67. I am absolutely, I'm enthused, uh, I'm excited about it. It hasn't diminished in any way whatsoever. And I think it's important, to, well, two things actually. Uh, at the end of 1 Corinthians 13, if that refers to the gifts ceasing with a closed canon, you would think that would be the last word in the subject, but Paul starts the whole topic up again in the very next chapter, in, in chapter 14. But I think one very important fact is the Holy Spirit glorifies Jesus. These gifts, they're not just to make a believer feel good, they're to build the body, but ultimately for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, that's, we need to make sure that our motives are right in seeking these gifts, which we're encouraged to seek after. Well, I've really enjoyed talking to you, Mark, and I want to thank you for coming thank here you. to Spain and uh, all the way from Ireland. And I look forward to the time when we can have uh, a Skype with you and give an opportunity for our viewers to actually come and interact with you about the gifts of the Spirit for today. Thank you to everyone out there for watching uh, Revelation TV. Keep watching, read the Word of God, check the Word out for yourself.